Hi everyone, the Personal Myth Guide is now out as a PDF on Gumroad and as a print book on Lulu. We're working actively as a team on getting it on Amazon, WH Smith, Barnes & Noble and other book retailers. Now today we'd like to share with you a section from the guide entitled The Relating Function, Jungian Personality Types. If you've ever tried to study typology, as lots of you guys tell us that you have, you'll have noticed that there are virtually infinite number of schools out there all saying different things, with most of them asserting that typology is one of the most important parameters to understanding an individual's psychology, and indeed by implication, the entirety of an individual's personality. Now, Stephen Pauline's 40 year long each clinical experience has found that this is categorically false. However, typology, based initially in Jung's original observations, is still a valid and important factor when understanding specifically ego consciousness, but more so understanding the so-called anima animus, or the relating function. In this section, you'll hear 16 essential study points to orient you through the field of typology, followed by a demonstration of how the negative anima or animus can be chased through the cognitive stack. And finally, we'll close up today's video with a series of notes on this subject. Steve Richards wrote the transcript and indeed the personal myth guide as a whole. If you'd like to pick up a copy of the full 458 A4 page personal myth guide, then you're more than welcome to do so from the links in the description. We want to say thank you to everyone who picked up a copy before launch. Sincerely. Your support has been staggering. But without any further ado, we bring you the relating function. Jungian personality types, a psychosystems approach within the practical context of the personal myth. Personality type is the most popular area of Jungian psychology, and also the most misunderstood. The topic is too large for detailed presentation in this guide, and so a careful study of the field is recommended. In the context of the personal myth, the following salient points are of note. One, Jung created his type theory to understand his own personality in contradistinction to that of both Freud and Adler, as he regarded the differences in their respective theories to reflect the differences in their personalities, with each theory being a quote-unquote personal statement of the founder that reflected their personality. 2. Type is not the same thing as character. Type expresses underlying character, but does not determine it. 3. Type is not fixed. 4. There are preferences, but these are adapted or habitual rather than strictly innate, although a default disposition towards favouring a particular type configuration may be inherited. 5. Jung did not use type tests. He was aware of them, but considered them suitable only for beginners and that type theory should not be used in isolation from a much wider and deeper understanding of depth psychology. 6. Reducing the human condition to type leads to typological reductionism and typism. It also filters and distorts the immediate and real perceptions that we have of others by forcing them into a typological framework. In effect, this creates an ego-identified complex in both the test administrator and the test subject, through shared suggestion. 7. The type is supposed to change, but not be fixed. This answers many of the critiques of, for example, the Myers-Briggs test, or MBTI, concerning test-retest validity. The MBTI has some face validity and construct validity, as empirical experience shows that Jung's types exist, albeit that it's far from certain which part of an individual's personality may have actually answered the test on any given occasion. Assessment must be observational and empirical. 8. Jung's type theory is a model of consciousness. The unconscious has no type, but at the same time, the potential for any and all types. The four functions he, Jung, identified thinking, feeling, sensing, and intuition are conscious functions in the sense that they are utilized by the ego, with one being normally favored or dominant, one being supportive or auxiliary, followed by a third, tertiary, and a fourth, inferior. Nine, these differ in relative consciousness with their distance from the ego's direct, reflexive, conscious use. It follows, therefore, that the inferior, or fourth function, is the most unconscious of the available functions. 
10. There's an empirical paradox in that the first level of unconsciousness, rather than the unconscious as such, is located inside the ego itself, specifically within the very function it most identifies with. The first layer of the shadow is the downside of our dominant type function. It's the last place that anyone looks within themselves, but the first place that others can see it. We are most unconscious of the shadow cast by our habitual cognitive function of ego consciousness. 11. The so-called negative anima or animus also has its presence within the dominant function of the ego. Again, a downside of the dominant function is that it hosts the most unconscious aspect of our relating function. This manifests firstly, as with the shadow as a baseline inferiority, hiding within our best and most conscious cognitive function. With the negative relating function, however, it can and does also manifest by reversing the attitude type, so that's introversion or extroversion, of the dominant cognitive function. For example, a dominant introverted thinking type, or TI, will suddenly reverse in attitude polarity and become a cold and or destructively related extroverted thinking type, or TE. A key indicator is the lack of relationship to the object or the other person. It's clear that this attitude reversal is not adapted. In effect, it's inferior. People informed by Jungian theory may interpret this as the shadow coming through, but as it's relational, it's actually the anima or animus in its negative form. The difference is nuanced and subtle, but with the shadow, it's generally just the downside of the normal type. In this example, TI. But with the negative anima or animus, you can see the reversal in attitude type. In this instance, from introversion to extroversion. 12. It is possible to chase the negative relating function down through the cognitive functions, from dominant through to inferior and out again. It's an empirical feature that the positive relating function tends to approach consciousness via the inferior function first. This does not mean that someone isn't using it, but that they are firstly unconscious of its use until they apperceive it through that function which is most different to their dominant cognitive function. The key factor is consciousness. We are differentially unconscious of the two opposite poles of the relating function. The positive we experience first, as coming through the inferior cognitive function, the negative hides right within what we think of most closely in typological terms as being us. 13. Type can also be shaped by others. For example, we can interject a whole type configuration from a parent or other significant figure in our lives and adjust ourselves against our natural inclination or intended direction. Type can further be modified on a more temporary basis by the influence of a specific individual, role, occupation, or peer group. 14. In the context of the personal myth, we need to assess if our type has changed over our life, as is normal, and what influences outside of our conscious will or intentionality may have led to this, either constructively or otherwise. 15. If we have been influenced by type theory, we need to assess as objectively as possible to what extent we may be weaned off the influence of such sources as internet gurus and entrepreneurs. 16. In the developed personality, type is best seen as a suite of options that can be utilised to engage with people in the wider social environment and as a key element in the relating system that delivers and receives communication into consciousness from the unconscious. On screen now, we can see the standard Jungian adapted cognitive function configuration for the ego, with one dominant, most used or adapted function, one auxiliary, which is the second most used or adapted function, one tertiary, which is the third most used or adapted function, and one inferior, which is the least used or adapted function. The areas of overlap show the relative development of the function by the ego. However, that standard configuration is not fixed. And on screen, you can see how those four different functions can become a suite of options, both in terms of which one the ego wishes to use at that current time, but also the attitude, whether or not the function is introverted or extroverted, can also be variable in that suite of option sense. The blue circle on screen can be any of the four cognitive functions, be that thinking, feeling, sensing or intuition. But for this example, let's say that any of those are the ego's current conscious dominant cognitive function. 
Here we see a schematic representation of how this ego's dominant function has two primary loci of unconsciousness. Both are routinely problematic and expressed via relating, internally and interpersonally. Chasing the negative relating function down the Jungian cognitive function stack. The following series of diagrams which you guys are about to see give a schematic representation of the process of quote unquote chasing the negative relating function down the Jungian personality theory cognitive function stack. This is based on over four decades of clinical empiricism with thousands of patients with whom typology was embedded as part of a much wider and deeper approach to the entire personality. Typology on its own, without that much broader clinical perspective, is insufficient and misleading, just as Jung himself knew it to be. It's been pressure tested as an integral part of the personal myth process in trainee psychotherapists for well over 30 years, as well as with many hundreds of people following their own path of personal development. In this representational example, a male INTP has his negative anima, or relating function, positioned unconsciously within his dominant introverted thinking function. His positive anima, or positive pole of the relating function, will appear within consciousness, from the bottom up, i.e. that function most distant from adapted conscious integration. In this sense, both positive and negative poles of the relating function can be said to be unconscious, with the quality of their unconsciousness being expressed through type as illustrated. Here, the INTP male has successfully disidentified with the negative anima as it operates through his dominant introverted thinking. In response, the negative anima will retreat into his second or auxiliary function, in this case, extroverted intuition. In most cases, the negative anima will already have a foothold in the auxiliary function, so it will adapt to the ego's attempt to chase it by strengthening its presence there. Note that becoming conscious of the negative anima in the dominant function does not in itself cause the positive anima to migrate closer to consciousness via the available functional types. So overall, so far, we've seen the quote-unquote negative anima move from the dominant introverted thinking function into the auxiliary extroverted intuition function. Here, the INTP male has successfully chased down the negative anima out from both his dominant and auxiliary cognitive functions. At this point, the negative anima will root itself in the tertiary, or third function. This will be difficult to deal with at first, as most people settle for a conscious relating adaptation to two rather than three or four of their available functions. As before, becoming conscious of the negative anima in the auxiliary function does not in itself cause the positive anima to migrate closer to consciousness via the available functional types. Here, the INTP male has successfully chased down the negative anima out from his tertiary function. This created a situation where the negative anima must ramp up its effects on the ego in order to remain in close contact to consciousness via the cognitive functions. At this point, the positive anima is in direct competitive polarity with the negative anima. The polarity, if not carefully and consciously managed by the ego through reflexive insight and action, will result in the above configuration, wherein the positive and negative poles occupy the dominant and inferior cognitive functions, respectively. This transitional phase of adaptation and dealing with the negative anima consciously must be handled with focus and attention to avoid it taking possession of the inferior function. And here, the INTP male has successfully chased down the negative anima out from his inferior function, whilst maintaining a dynamic and conscious relationship to his positive anima, extending this into his auxiliary function. The negative anima has not disappeared, it's simply no longer occupying one or other of the ego's cognitive functions. The same dynamic is involved with the so-called shadow. The negative relating function and the first layer of the shadow routinely occupy our dominant and auxiliary cognitive functions unless we consciously develop or individuate. What follows now are some notes by Steve Richards, the guy who wrote the transcript that you guys have just listened to, on the anima and the animus taken from primarily the Jung to Live By Discord server, which you guys can join by signing up from the Patreon link in the description. 
A danger in not seeing women as women and thinking that they're just our anima projection is narcissism and that we won't understand who we are attempting to relate to or indeed the fact that the true nature of what we call female psychology includes their animus, which is not us, but them. So falling in love with their animus projection onto us is just as narcissistic. Relating is much harder work. If someone thinks their anima is a woman, then he'll never understand women. He needs to understand the animus to understand women. If he understands the anima, he'll understand men. A paradox, but true. Same for women. If they understand the animus, they understand themselves, not men. Watch your anima. It will masquerade as your shadow and fool you into thinking you know it. Relating sorts the shadow out, but the negative anima animus can, via a depolarized dominant function, or just simply taking it and your auxiliary over, masquerade functionally as your shadow, and do a look over here hypnotic induction on the ego. There is always the unintended dynamic that the ego projects itself back into the unconscious, and hence sees a variant image of itself. This is a problem with any psychotherapy that suggests that reified parts as subpersonalities of various kinds exist as animated homunculi in people's heads. This is not to experience the unconscious as it is on its own terms. One problem has, as I say, been that Jungians, Gestalt therapists, transpersonalists, etc. often tend to reify the unconscious in an ego sense, as being populated by little versions of themselves or as symbols that should be transformed into mythological caricatures. It's very easy to do this. The cortex has massive spare capacity for generating fantasy images. An approach that is open to the psyche communicating how it wants to will get you very different and far more authentic results. Hence, the anima as you experienced it was very likely to be a co-construct between a natural process, the psyche, and how your ego position, through its learning of a psychological theory, insisted that it should present. Most people exposed to Jungian ideas who are serious about them do this. The problem, then, is to get them to experience the psyche without the intermediary of a demand from the ego, that it must appear this or that way. It's enlightening when we simply ask it to be itself. Theoretically, it's also very informative to catch up with developments in just what the unconscious and indeed the ego really are, as opposed to some now very outdated views that are scooped up as a priori expectations of the reality of them. If I may make a brief comment, the main problem is with the major premise, that the anima is an inner woman. If the anima, as Jung suggests, is an inner woman, and if it characterizes the unconscious, then the unconscious, being of indefinitely larger volume and extent than the ego, literally suggests that most of a man's psychology is female. Jung makes the same assertion over the shadow, when he defines it, as he often does, as a generic term for the unconscious, that most of the psyche is the shadow. It can't be both the anima and the shadow if those terms have any meaning at all. The main empirical reason that the anima is male psychology is that it arises in men, not in women, and not by convenience of term, but by characteristics. Those attributes ascribed to it are found in men. In women's psychology, you find what Jung called the animus, not the anima. To get away from gender altogether, both refer to the relating function, which, when analysed empirically, have specific characteristics which must be genetic or genomic. Men have to forgive women for not being their anima, and women forgive men for not being their animus. Stop blaming each other for your own psychology and its projections. That way, a lot is learned. The shadow develops in relation to the ego. Truly, there is no light without shade, but reciprocally, there is no shadow without light, or no shadow without ego. Relating is the key. The relating function, or Jung's anima animus, is present immediately from birth instinctively. The anima and animus as components of the relating function are instincts. The shadow develops later, in tandem with the ego. The relating function has an essential role in regulating the shadow. If we relate properly, the shadow will not overreach itself in attempt to correct for our one-sided maladaptations. It follows that if we relate properly, then the shadow retains its homeostatic balance. The anima needs reframing to escape the trap that it's a woman, inner or outer. We can stop blaming women then for our own psychology. The anima, as commonly understood, is male psychology, not female in any sense other than the fundamental reasons that it is in part projected onto women. 
If it's treated as if it's a woman, either inner or outer, then women will forever be a mystery and not in any truly psychological sense, real. Jung himself in the Houston interviews with Richard Evans states that anima projection, where it is that, is without conscious will or intentionality, whether this is positive or negative. Any depth psychologist with clinical experience will confirm the power of this factor and how involuntary it is, as well as how overpowering. We don't reduce it to a genetic fit bioreductively, but we aren't psychoreductive either. The effect is whole spectrum biopsychosocial. Jung's self archetype concept is psychoreductive and outdated. The answer has to be in the doing of relating, which is why it's the most important psychodynamic that there is. Relationships start, fail, and start all the time. Ultimately, it's the most problematic area of human experience. Learn as much as you can and then follow your instincts, but be prepared to test them. The anima is not conscious in the sense that the ego is. It's a function that gets reified or turned into the imago of a personality. It's also not one thing. It's an amalgam of several factors, some of which are complementary, others at times antagonistic. The result of this is that from the ego's perspective, it, or the anima, can appear to be a goddess of wisdom, a goddess of illusion, or any other thing. The mistake can be a product of the ego overusing it by over-reifying it. The structure of the anima, if analysed beneath the amargo the ego nurtures of it, will reveal its multiplex nature. Jungians and others have nurtured a personified anima and so create a complex that conceals rather than reveals exactly what this relating function is. Just as the anima is not an inner woman in a man, it is not an independent human, conscious personality acting like an inner goddess, a witch or whatever. It is real, but the truth of that reality is outside of how it is reified. This explains the common confusion and paradoxes encountered by well-meaning people who follow the encouragement of Jungians in personifying things whose innate nature has very little to do with ego consciousness. Jung's model of the anima animus is itself an issue. Jung's view of what he describes through them is highly conflated and idiosyncratic. There are reasons why they've not been taken up by the wider psychological community. The elements he ascribes to the anima animus are real psychologically, but the way he systematizes them and reifies them does not withstand pressure testing outside of an uncritical a priori belief. This is a hard red pill, but without taking it, there's a massive abyss waiting, one full of the auto-suggestive constructs that cluster around the introjections of Jungian fantasies. If you're looking to take your study of depth psychology and personal development to the next level using Stephen Pauline's 40-year-long clinical experience as your personal guide, then make sure you check out Young to Live By's flagship offering, Discover Your Personal Myth Ultimate Handbook. For anyone who has a calling deep in their very genome to become who they truly feel they should be, this guide is utterly indispensable. Pick up your copy today and make 2021 the year you truly begin to become yourself.